Uh, there we go. Welcome to Egypt Travel Tips, Tricks, and Insider Advice with myself, Laura Ranieri Roy, and my dear partner in travel, Anna McKay of Your Journey. Um, to start and get you in a mood, we wanted to play a quick preview. Last time we were in Egypt, Anna, it was, oh my gosh, it was close to two years ago. Or was it more than, it was January, February, 2020. So this is the first time um, we're going back in about uh, two weeks now. But the last time we were there, we recorded little videos. This is just a day in the life to get you in the mood to start. There's no one here. are still coming in so those of you who are arriving we're just getting started you haven't missed much just a little preview video sorry if that was a bit me centric and here's Francois here too uh say hi Francois hi. so this is stuff I just filmed on my own uh iPhone and Anna's taken some great shots too it's just a way of showing you some of the things we do I'm Laura Ranieri Roy uh I'm Ancient Egypt Alive and it's an organization that's been around since 2013 uh, actually started when I was a master's student at University of Toronto, and the idea is to inspire passion about Egypt's past through education, through courses, uh, through online content, and I've been doing tours with the wonderful Anna McKay for over 10 years now, um, and we've been even done tours to Egyptian collections and world, muse world museums. We also together um, uh, support archaeology projects and animal uh, projects. Uh, we just, uh, Francois and I just popped over to Egypt to rescue 10 dogs about two weeks ago. Um, Anna, do you want to introduce your journey as well? Sure. Can I just bug you for a second? You got a black bar on the screen again. Yes, I've got it. Thank you. Yes, let's get rid of that. If you guys can let people in the meeting room as soon as possible uh, who enter, it, it won't interrupt my screen. Great. Yes, Laura, my, my dad actually is trying to get in, but he hasn't been able to. You, okay. Is that Dan or Dave? Uh, Sandra. Hi, Laura. Sandra, nice to see you. Okay. So, <laughs> nice uh, Virginia, yeah. my dad is Just, trying to log in, but oh. Uh, is he should be in now. Is everybody in that's in the waiting room, ladies? Yep. Okay, good. Sandra, uh, okay. Is, are you yeah. there? Sandra's. Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let, let me ask him. Okay, hopefully he'll be there. We'll solve it. Anna. Hey there. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Anna from Your Journey. Uh, I've been in the travel business since uh, a while, 1982. Uh, I've been sending people to Egypt for 35, 40, 40 some odd years, 40 years. Um, yeah. Anna is, is over 90. She looks great, doesn't she? <laughs> she's a, she actually started in her teens. She is not old. She's uh she's very vibrant, but gosh, what a background. Uh, yeah, so Egypt is one of my all-time favorite places, as anybody who knows me knows. 
and Laura and I have been doing these tours for quite some time and uh, we're looking very forward to actually having a group there the end of this month. It's been way too long, almost three years. Absolutely. We, we, were, we were there last October for a little tiny bit, but not with the tour. So, um, yeah, and my favorite place is S1, uh, one of my all-time favorites. It's, uh, I don't know, I always feel like I'm home there. I love Cairo, I love the city, um, but S1 is is my uh, happy place for sure. Wonderful, and I've already probably talked too much. Uh, I'm an Egyptologist, uh, University of Toronto. I have a ba long background as a writer and a performer, a presenter. And I love, oh my gosh, I love everywhere, but I love the gods with Wawit. He is the opener of the ways. And I kind of like to embrace that myself. He was the opener of the ways in the afterlife and into battle for the king. But I'd love to be the opener of the ways for, for everyone to come to Egypt. And also Ptah, the Memphis creator god, who created the universe by thinking and speaking it into existence. Love that God. There I am with Ta and my favorite place. Well, Luxor is pretty special because Francois and I, another Egyptologist, met in, uh, in our studies of ancient Egypt and got married in Luxor in 2015, even set our vows at the Mut Temple at Karnak. Oh, and there we are, Anna. Mm. Yeah, that was great. We, well, we had, it was a little adventure getting home from the trip we were on, but yeah, we, we, whenever we can stop in Cairo, we will. It was, we got, yeah, we got caught in a little, a, a little um, military uh, uh, issue um, in, in Khartoum, um, where we were locked in. We were not uh, selling tours to Khartoum at this point, but uh, certainly Egypt is safe. Um, we were felt safe enough in Khartoum, but we couldn't get back. So we, the only way out would be to come via Egypt. We came, we saw, we conquered, we saw this beautiful newly opened Baron Empan Palace, this gorgeous um, 1920s, fantastic um, uh, uh, place to visit in Heliopolis, really near the site of the oldest obelisk in Egypt. This was the site of Heliopolis, the, the birthplace of creation. It's now a gorgeous open air museum. And the next people who come on tour with us, we're gonna start going to Heliopolis to start the tour because this is where creation began for Egypt as well. So, Anna, do you wanna talk about what we're gonna talk about today? Um, yeah, so today we're gonna to go over the highlights of Egypt. Um, we're gonna kind of run through one of our tours to give you an idea how the trip flows and hopefully touch on most of your questions that you have about the trip and please, Put your questions in the chat box as we go and we'll answer them as we'll have a couple breaks we'll stop and ask questions and just yeah this the the general overview of traveling in egypt our little um uh, tips and tricks and um a little recap on what kind of tours that we've got coming up and that's yeah that's pretty well it but the big thing is ask away any questions at all just put them in the chat and we'll get to them and sorry laura you got that little box again Yep. All right. Well, um, also, I just want to say this is interactive. Please, uh, I don't even mind if people pipe up and ask a question or say, wow, that's cool. What about this? Um, let's make, have fun today. It's not a, a lecture per se. Very much we want to be interactive. So wanted to talk about uh, Cairo, which is another one of my favorite places. You know, I've been to Egypt now, I'm thinking it's 16. Sometimes I get a little bit hazy on how many times. I just got back two weeks ago, but I love Cairo very, very much. And uh, it's one of my very, very favorite places. And I love it, the museum. And you can see I was there in the summer of 2020, 21, and there was no one on the second floor of the Egyptian museum. <laughs> had it all to ourselves. I can tell you, I will show some slides a little later. Actually, we're coming back to the museums later on. But it's really been transformed. It is beautiful, all new paint, new display cards, full of treasures. You can see them more now as well. So a uh, really exciting place to visit or revisit. The other uh, site I'm, we're gonna come back to that is very much open, and I just visited it two weeks ago, is the new, now there's many new museums in Cairo, but the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization in Fustat is where the mummies are now. 
And it's very impressive collection, beautiful new building, and I'll come back to it. So, um, Anna, uh, do you want to talk about getting to the pyramids? And if anyone has any questions on the pyramids, this is like the number one tourism spot in the world, and people have a lot of misconceptions about it. Uh, Giza, depending on um, where, when in the tour we do it, but basically, as Laura says, it's the highlights. But I, I would like to make a little comment that everybody always says they come for the pyramids and then everything else is just amazing, uh, especially the other, other tombs. The pyramids, uh, we go up there, we go into at least one of the, the pyramids. It depends on which ones are open. It changes all the time. Um, we do a great uh, view around the pyramids. We try to get into some of the other little lesser known spots. They've been doing so much work on the Giza Plateau. It's, every time we go there, uh, it changes. Um, and then of course, the Sphinx, who is, you know, iconic and beautiful. Yes, absolutely. There's so much to see at the pyramids. And I was just there two weeks ago. Uh, very exciting time to visit Egypt, um, especially if you're thinking of 23 or 24, because it's in process. They are re-envisioning, reimagining the plateau. Um, part of the reason for this is to preserve the monuments better. Uh, they want these monuments to endure. It's been a little bit chaotic in past decades with a lot of vendors, uh, no real good protection of these, these monuments, people being able to get right up, even climbing on top of things. They're now doing things like creating a, a solid entry place, getting all of the, the, the uh, camel and horse drivers into one solid area. Um, they're going to be installing electric trams to make it easier to get around from site to site, uh, walkways. They're going to have a central visitor center, just like they do at the Valley of the Kings. Everything is being transformed for a better tourism experience um, and easier access to the to the uh, the monuments, but also to preserve them because yes, they've endured four thousand years, but the world is changing. So, so glad to hear they're doing that. One of the exciting things is they, they're they launching dining places within on the plateau, and this has never uh, been the case before. Here we are, uh, the summer of 2021, this, this beautiful restaurant had just opened, and I think we're going to take our groups here from now on. Look at the view you get of all three pyramids. This is the first time on Giza. It's called the uh, 99, Nine Pyramids View. Actually, I think I got the name wrong there. Nine <laughs> Pyramids View. And it's the initiative of, an, of a private investor who was very smart, bought up the land and, and decided to launch this restaurant. Really great food, great views. And let me show you what you can see now. There are gonna be four panoramic views. That's what you'll get to enjoy now. And uh, here is the view from that new restaurant uh, where you can look out. There's nine pyramids on Giza. There's a three. There are Queen's pyramids as well. And some of them you can go inside. Uh, there's also mastabas from the Old Kingdom, which are very, very interesting. So many things you can explore and get right up close to history um, at the pyramids of Giza. It that, view really is just, that view is just stunning. Like the way they've, they've started to reimagine the plateau is just, it's amazing. Yeah. You yeah. never used to get views like that. I can't believe I was just sitting there two weeks ago. I, even when I was there, it was like, this is a dream. How did I get here? You know? And that's how you tend to feel when, when, you're, when you're at the pyramids. Now, here's my scoop. Uh, again, uh, the date I was there, I believe it was, it was exactly two weeks ago. Anyway, here's my scoop. Beautiful cafe. This is more 
part formal dining. Uh, very few people know about it. It's just been open. The Cuckoo Center, if you're coming to the Isa Plateau, I want to find dining with a view of the pyramids. You can now have it. This is amazing news from Giza. So there you go. Sorry, the volume's a little down there, but you get the idea. Second restaurant on the plateau. So Anna, let's move to Saqqara. Um, give us an idea, give people an idea of how easy it is to go from Cairo, where your hotel might be, to Giza and Saqqara. Uh, well, both places are about a half an hour, well, depending on where your hotel is and what the traffic's like. But uh, the other thing that, that um, they've done in the last 10 years, five to 10 years, is they've got a new big ring road that goes around Cairo. So it's much, much easier to get from Giza and Cairo out to Saqqara now. So you're looking at half an hour from, like for example, from the Ramses Hilton, half an hour to Giza, half an hour to Saqqara, about the same. Um, again, depending on, on traffic, but I don't know, the last few times we've gone there, we haven't had much trouble getting to or from with that new road. You, know, you can easily do, although I don't necessarily recommend it, you could do a quick trip to Saqqara for a half day and a trip to Giza for a second half day. But if, if you have the time, spread it out as much as you can. And you're Saqqara- just, You're just gonna see a tiny bit if you do that. Saqqara, there is so much. and. Saqqara is known for the Step Pyramid, which was the first pyramid here. It's not just the first pyramid, it's the world's first building in stone. This was built in 2650 by the King Djoser. But this is just the tip of the iceberg, literally. Um, far more than Giza, and I mentioned there's Mastabas and Queen's Pyramids, but there are dozens and dozens of Old Kingdom tombs and New Kingdom tombs and other pyramids to view at Saqqara. It is the largest necropolis in Egypt, um, used continually from pre-dynastic times all the way to the late period and even Ptolemaic and Roman period. There's so much to see. It is incredibly exciting. But if we want to talk about Djoser and the first pyramid, a lot new has changed there too. Never before um, in the 20th century, really, it's always been restricted going underneath this pyramid is un unusual in that it's, it's amazing on the top of the ground, but underneath the earth, uh, the ancients dug miles and miles of labyrinthine uh, pathways. There are rooms that are actually decorated with beautiful faience stone. Djoser's body was buried deep under the earth, and now you can go under the step pyramid and see a little bit of these passageways. And here I have a little video when we visited in, se in September. Uh, or August of 2021. The Step Pyramid of Djoser, the underground passageways for the first time. These are uh, miles and miles of tunnels underneath the Step Pyramid. Um, it's like Djoser was creating his own map to the underworld. They're very uh, much associated with siren beliefs. And uh, unlike uh, the tunnels under the pyramids, these are quite wide. We're able to stand straight up and just amazing, just restored over the last decade or two and open to the public over the last year, over COVID, ironically. But this is amazing. And we're now coming, we're coming to the most incredible part, which is where the burial chamber was sunk deep, deep, deep into the ground. Actually, it was redone twice. Uh, this massive sarcophagus lowered into the bowels of the earth underneath the step pyramid. I'm just gonna stop there. You get the idea. Um, it's, it's exciting and you can go into some chambers underneath there uh, and there are decorated ones too. Not sure about the access to those ones uh, just yet. Anna, what else can you see at Saqqara other than the step pyramid? Mm. Well, you know, there's just <laughs> the largest concentration of monuments in, in Egypt. Uh, it's unbelievable. Um, and sorry, I just had to smile because I can't wait to get into Saqqara. When we were there last time, it opened two weeks after we were there. Um, so all kinds of old... old, old oh, you're talking about uh, the one we went into? Yeah. The Tomb of No, Maine. no, I'm saying I can't wait to get oh, into... Oh, to the Step Pyramid, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm so looking forward to that. Yeah. And, um, as you were saying, not sure what's open. It does change all the time, especially for the step, but it's definitely open. We'll just see what we what we get to see, if we get to see what you showed the video there, or if we get to go further down, which I'm crossing my fingers we do. Um, yeah. yeah. And this then one. lots of other tombs and uh, other tons of other pyramids and uh, many highlights, but I'll let you talk about the highlights. Well, I'm just showing the tomb of Meruka. He was a mayor in the Sixth Dynasty of Egypt under a, a couple of Sixth Dynasty kings, lots of Tetis and Pepis. They always had very cute names in the Sixth Dynasty. Teti, Pepi. There was a couple of couple of Pepis. And uh, but this this was a dynasty where the officials started getting very spoiled and very privileged. This guy had many many chambers for his family in his tomb. He wasn't a king. He's just a mayor. Look at the fine workmanship everywhere. A lot of these officials tombs are beautiful. And here Anna and I, this tomb had just been restored and opened when we got to Saqqara. And because our guides are so amazing and are so well connected, ah, we got kind of first entry for our whole group into the tomb of Mehu with the most amazing, this is a false door. What does a false door mean? It means the spirit could pass through to get his his offerings to keep his ka alive. So it didn't need to be a real door and open because it was just for the spirit. But look at the beautiful paint on that, 4,000 years old. And we're now going into the Serapium. What was the Serapium? It was this enormous um, burial site, uh, this, this beautiful funerary complex for apis bulls. These enormous bulls would be mummified and put in giant sarcophaguses very big in the Ptolemaic period from the New Kingdom to Ptolemaic, unbelievable uh, sites at Saqqara. Do you want to talk about Unas, uh, Anna? Oh, this is one of my favorite places, actually. When, when did we go there? 2016, I think, was the first time we went there that it had been reopened after being closed for 20, 20 to 25 years. Um, the original, uh, the tomb with with pyramid with text, sorry. Um, and I won't, I won't spoil it for everybody who hasn't been there yet, but there's some very cool little features in this yeah. tomb that, uh, that we'll show you when we're there. It's, it's pretty spectacular. And it's like magic. Like, yeah. <laughs> and it's one of the tombs that is not too hard. You, I got a bit of a scuttle to get in, but it's pretty easy for, so, for, for people who are claustrophobic and, you know, not too sure. This is a good one to try. Exactly. And there also UNAS has um, pyramids were not just pyramids. There's all sorts of features that each pyramid has. And one of them was the causeway, which is this processional route uh, that the funeral would proceed along. These used to be rude. The, the best one that exists today from the old kingdom is the, the causeway of UNAS. And here we are proceeding along that beautifully preserved a causeway all the way to the pyramid. Anna, do you want to talk about Dashur? Hmm. So Dashur is the other, a lot of people don't go into Dashur. Um, when we go there quite often, we'll be the only vehicle, the only group there. Um, and another, actually now we can go into both of them. Um, the used to be only get into the Red Pyramid. Now you can get into the Bent as well. So this is your real Indiana Jones just feel when you go into these pyramids. Um, and the other thing that I like about here is the red pyramid. Again, for people who are a little worried about going in the pyramids or are having, having trouble with scuttling up and down, the red is amazing because you can go up these staircase. And even if you don't go into the pyramid, you can sit up at the top and the view is, is astounding. And this is where you really feel like you're kind of by yourself where Giza now is quite surrounded by city. Here it's not. So you really get that feel. Okay. And this you is are... our favorite video. Yes. <laughs> this Ever. is what it's like to go inside the Bent Pyramid that just opened. Um, we visited in 2020. It had only been open for a little bit. Let's yeah. take a look. Okay. <sighs> We're actually going into the Bent Pyramid. It's only been open for six months. Whoa. Bridget, what's the experience like for you? It's fantastic. And going backwards is an excellent choice. 
And as long as you stay parallel, you're really good. Would you do it over and over again? Yes. Okay, there you go. We have a big fan of the bed pyramid. I would do this again, and now I'm glad there are more lights. <laughs> now I can see I'm sorry. How are you finding it, Jan? <laughs> oh, I'm doing all right. Okay, good to hear. But okay. I kind of wish I was four foot two. Yes, it would be easier to be a pygmy going into this, but it's always an adventure, a real Indiana Jones style adventure, yes. going into the bent pyramid. And they've oh, we got lights on, really, come on. I, I just, I've seen this video like, I don't know, 30 times. I just love these, these two. And incidentally, Jan is rebooked with us to come back in February, 2024. If you want to travel with Jan and Bridget is thinking about it in, in coming years, coming back okay. to us too. That's what people do. They come back to Egypt because you get, gets under your skin and you, and you can't stop uh, being fascinated. Right, Anna? Yeah, the one thing I really like about that video is it really gives you an idea of what it's like to go into the pyramid. Um, they've done so much work on lighting and safety to get in and out and to preserve the pyramid and to, you know, make it safer for people. So I just, I, I grin every time. I love that video. <laughs> and possibly if you look hard enough, you might find Snefru because we don't know where he is. And uh, odds are he might be somewhere in or under the bent pyramid. So um, go in and, and see what you can find. Uh, Cairo, I love its medieval history. Gosh, it almost fascinates me now because I've been so immersed in pharaonic history. It almost fascinates me as much as, as the pharaonic stuff I've studied. Uh, just so rich. The architecture is just, uh, it's, it's an embarrassment of riches from the medieval world. And one of the places that is the most, uh, the most beautiful mosque, we see a lot of amazing medieval mosques, but this is a special, this is very special, isn't it, Anna, the mosque of Sultan Hassan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, another place that they've, they've fixed up very well. Um, it's a pretty special, pretty special place to go into. Yes. It used to be a, a madrasa as well, a school. It was built during the plague. And often when we go there, and I don't think I have this recording, we get to hear the imam sing. It's just a, a very, it's actually, if you're spiritual at all, as I am a little bit and a little intuitive, this is one of the places where I definitely feel an energy inside. Very, very powerful. Uh, Anna, do you want to talk about this special experience? Yeah, so we... One night of the the tours, we'll go into this beautiful old Islamic building, and these guys here that you see in the picture that we'll show you a video of are the national uh, performers, the Egypt Egyptian national uh, troupe that travel around the world um, that do Sufi and traditional music, and it's pretty spectacular. <laughs> That's just Anna's own cell phone video. Uh, yeah, just not high tech. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that 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 uh, Sufi, he when we saw him, it was forty five minutes. He's found for forty five minutes. I don't and I don't know how he does it. Yeah, fantastic. This is what we try to do in our tours: is have special experiences. It's not all uh, rocks and sand. We try to have a good pace of different experiences. And one thing you won't find on the tours Anna and I do are the sponsored shopping stops, right, Anna? Where you, oh, let's go to a perfume factory or let's go, let's go to someone's brother's uh, store. Uh, Anna has a particular aversion to that sort of thing, the touristic <laughs> stuff, right? Yeah, we will, if people want to stop and go somewhere, we'll arrange it, but it's not, it's not something I do on, on a daily basis, that's for sure. Yeah, I love the slide, Laura. Yeah, I, this is these are all my pictures, and 
I, you know, we can talk a lot about the amazing pyramids and the, the tombs and, and some of the culture and the Islamic buildings. But, you know, when you go to Egypt, what really surprises people are the Egyptians. They are so funny, first of all. They've got this the greatest sense of humor. Um, there's a guy in Luxor walking along the street. Some British guy must have gone in his shop and said, what a load of rubbish. So he stands on the corner and says, hey, come and take a look at my rubbish. <laughs> you know, and just they're funny, they're warm, they're welcoming, they're lovely. And it really surprises you with this. So the tomb guards are so sweet. This is a guy at Mednet Habu, the temple of, of Ramses III. Uh, you will also see as you drive through the country, um, the scenes of the rural Egyptians, the farmers who are still plying their trade as you see on the tomb walls from 4,000 years ago, and the guys with their boats still um, still driving the, you know, the waters of the Nile on boats uh, as they have been for 5,000 years. And the great names. They have great names on their boats. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, the new Titanic. That was my yeah. favorite. <laughs> so, okay, uh, this is, that's Rami. Rami will be leading our tours uh, in the next uh, little while. We <clears> love Rami, I'm sorry, I'm just using the wrong name. Oh, oh my God. Rami has led our tours in May, but this is uh, our new guide, Hussam, who has is talk about warm and wonderful and funny. He will have you laughing, and he's a great storyteller and uh, uh, very excited to be traveling with him soon. Um, these are, Anna, do you want to go through some of the questions? And maybe we can take a few questions from people. Sure. I'll just go through these ones because they're the ones that we always get asked. Um, no, women do not have to wear a head covering. Um, and as Laura and I will both say, we've traveled all over Egypt by ourselves with people, with not people, with a group, not with a group. And I, I always feel safe. Um, I find some people will feel a little intimidated because the Egyptians can be a little in your face sometimes. Um, but almost always they're like, where are you going? And the reason they're asking that, especially if you happen to be by yourself, is they want to make sure you're safe. Where are you going? We Can we help you? Um, how hot is it going to be? You know, for between November and March, it's usually perfect traveling weather around 25 degrees celsius approximately when we get down into aswan it can get up to 28 29 and in cairo depending on the days it can be as cool as 10 or 15 degrees it really depends cairo gets a lot of winds off the sahara so it can cool it right down um and uh what is the food like well we'll have i think we'll have some pictures later on food the food's amazing it's wonderful it's also pretty easy to accommodate for vegetarians and special special dietary for for people with um even vegan vegan not as easy but we can still do it okay um, you're not going to be able to accommodate me well i've been trying keto so forget that because, but vegans well, that's, because are you, that's because you love the bread. Now, if you could ignore the bread, you'd be fine, but you can't, it's too good. <laughs> yeah, it's easier to be a vegan or vegetarian in Egypt than it will be to, to do a keto diet. I'm going to try to go low carb, but we'll, we'll see. Um, and I would also say with the time to go, I, I moved the, uh, we moved the tour to later February because that is going to be beautiful and warm. It's a bit chilly in January. So yeah. if you if you don't mind it to be a little chilly, because you will sometimes you saw some of our shops, people had some some jackets on. Um, I like to go a little later. I prefer it to be a nice warm spring like temper spring to summer than to be chillier. So uh, yeah. if you're worried about cool, I'd say the coldest month is January. Sure. Um, and uh, yes. And, and yeah, and December, January. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, tipping again. With most of uh, the day-to-day -day stuff on the tour, we cover most of the tipping. Um, so for, besides that, you're basically just tipping your driver and your guide at the end of the trip pretty well. Um, and language barrier, oh, it's amazing how much you can convey with a smile and uh, a few things here and there. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of people in restaurants and the hotels, they will all speak English. 
Um, it's when you get into the small markets, um, you, you'll have, they'll have enough, like Laura says, I love those guys. Come look at my rubbish. Um, they'll, they'll have enough English to converse with you. Um, aggressive sellers. This is definitely something that we'll, we'll, we talk about on the tours. It, it's, it's a funny one. I really find if, if you just say no and smile and be friendly and keep walking, they'll go away. But if they really think that you are looking at something and you really want it, they will be persistent. Now, they're not going to be pushy or like as in physically or anything like that, but they'll try to sell you something. They'll follow you all the way down the path. But if they really, but it's just smile and keep on going. Um, Do we have any um, questions in the chat box, Anna? Um, no, I only see one. Um, okay. Oh, aren't head coverings needed for women in mosques? Actually, not really. Um, we always say to have a scarf with you um, to cover if, if you would like to, but it, it's not mandatory when you go into the mosque. Most of the mosques that we go into are actually more of a museum mosque. Um, so you can put your headscarf on, but you don't necessarily need it. The, the places that's the most strict are the Coptic churches, and you definitely have to have your shoulder covers and you can't be wearing shorts men or women when you go into a Coptic church. So actually the Coptic churches are more restrictive on what you have to wear than in the mosques. But, but generally they have a scarf with you. Um, but they're not going to say you can't come in with a scarf for, for the mosques we go into. But I think also um, it's good idea in general in Egypt, certainly there's a lot of travelers who wear their tank tops and shorts, but it really not appropriate it's um if you can see the way we're dressed here i have a, a long skirt uh and, and it has we have long shirts on um and, your shirt. <laughs> and and yeah you you should wear long long sleeve cotton and uh pants or long skirt good walking shoes uh is the best attire as well and we're so welcome you feel so welcome everywhere in egypt now this somebody, is sorry, somebody had a question on backpacks. Uh, do you mean backpacks okay to go into places? Is that what you mean? Sorry, I'm not sure who. Uh, yes, Anna. Yes, because I see that people are going into the, the pyramids and there's not too much space. So I wonder, you know, if you're wearing a backpack or should you wear something yeah. smaller? You definitely, very bad idea. The, you, very, you definitely can't get into the pyramids with your backpack on. There's absolutely no room. Um, uh, so we always suggest just to leave your backpack, your bigger backpack on the bus. Um, and in the museums, they don't like big backpacks either. So a small, you know, like one of those little smaller ones, like a little sling one or whatever, where you can put like a bottle of water or something like that. Um, but right. a big, back, big backpack, you can definitely leave on the bus. Uh, but yeah, you're not going to, you'll get stuck. <laughs> yeah, going I think that's, is that Sandra? <laughs> is that Sandra? Yes. Yes. yes, Sandra. So what's great about being in a nice deluxe private tour is the bus is never far. It's very secure. The driver's always with it. So we get off at a site. All your clunky stuff can be with you a few minutes away. So, OK, we're going to the pyramids. Leave all the unnecessaries. Just take I have one of those little Anna and I have one of those little tracker purses. I take that in like the little close to your body. And I have my water bottle and, can't you yeah. know, cell phone. Okay. And, the other you know. thing as well is what we'll do is, you know, even if you have a small pack or whatever, one of us just stays with the bags. Well, right. you know, yes, outside. because you, you okay. know, you need a little bit of a bag for your camera and stuff in the day. But again, there's always at least two people um, that'll be there. So we'll, we'll just, you'll see me very many times with five bags around my feet while everybody goes in and out. So. <laughs> there you go. Good question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so this is Dana, one of our lovely friends and travelers who came with us. Uh, I think this is from 2016, but it was a good scenario because here's a lady in her seventies and she thought, you know, wasn't feeling very well. And uh, she didn't feel like she wanted to walk around the plateau, but look, we found, we set her at the restaurant, actually we've even better restaurant now that nine pyramids view is open but this was, we, she sat at the restaurant, waited for us to do our touring, was able to gaze out at the, both the Sphinx and the pyramid and enjoyed it. You can do as much as you feel fit to do. We have travelers that anywhere from 
we've had people in their 30s all the way to 90 take our tour. So uh, we've even had uh, children once in a while. So um, we, we really accommodate all age groups. The median age is usually between 45 and 75, but you know, or 50 and 70, but uh, certainly older people are very, very welcome. We've had people with canes and, uh, and then there's Lorna, who is our 87 year old from uh, uh, Revelstoke, BC, who went inside every pyramid with her cane, um, up every tomb climbing, and then uh, closed down the bar every night. <laughs> Uh, so, and how about shorts for the, the pyramids, you know, in the area? You're, uh, you're fine for when you're touring around the, the pyramids for shorts. I always, I always just suggest pants because you're, it, it can get really tight and you can rub, you know, rub up against your, your legs when you're getting in and out of um, tombs and what have you. So I personally always wear pants, but you can definitely wear shorts. It's not a problem in Giza and when you're touring anywhere, as long as they're like, you know, the ones that go to your knees, not, I wouldn't think you'd be wearing your hot pant shorts. <laughs> I, you know, I, I like to wear long linen or cotton pants everywhere. I don't know. They're comfortable too. And it's just, you. there's so much dust, dust at some of the sites as well. And it's just, I think it's maybe in Luxor and on the cruise is, is really nice for shorts, mm -hmm. but I would say for Cairo, yeah, Saqqara. Saqqara and Giza pyramids, it's better to have long pants. Um, oh, sorry, hey. Laura, yeah. sorry, one a second. I think Lewis was still saying something. I couldn't hear you. I think okay. you muted yourself. I can't, can't hear you, Lewis. Hello? Oh, I can try again. No, I can't hear you. <laughs> okay, Lewis. Just pipe up when you can and we'll... Or just type in in the chat again, sorry. I could hear you a second ago, but now I can't hear you. Lewis is coming with us in a couple of weeks, so I'm sure he might have pending questions. Um, so is Diane in general here? Yep, she's here somewhere. Are you hiding, Diane? Diane? Diane, can you unmute yourself? Diane is here enjoying her camel ride. Are you there, Diane? No, I think she is gone now. Oh, she's there and gone. She, he, she's one of our travelers who was going to signed up for this, and uh, has is coming back for a second time. We have people who travel with us multiple times, and we're going to talk about what their favorite memory is. Is there anyone else online who's traveled with us before? I'm not sure for this one. We had a whole bunch of them when we did this in June, um, and then they proceeded to rebook again. Uh, these ladies in particular. Um, so I don't think Diane is here, right? No, I think she must have gone. She was there earlier, but I don't see her now. Okay. So some of the favorite Egypt memories, I know for me, always being in Aswan and doing that camel, the camel experience, we don't tend to do it at Giza at the pyramids. We find the, the um, Bedouin camels going up to the monastery at Aswan. I'm going to show you a video soon. That is a stellar experience. The balloon tour is uh, here's Karen Markham, uh, just lovely couple who came with us, very well-traveled couple inside the pyramids and uh, enjoying. And this is going up even to Loon Mosque. We go to very rare sites that usually a lot of groups don't go to. The second oldest mosque, really the oldest in Cairo, and going up the minarets is always a thrill uh, when you first arrive. Now, I'm going to take you, actually, I'm going to go back because I want to move from Cairo and take you what we love to do with our tours, uh, with the exception of Tutankhamun tour, leaving in two weeks, it's a bit different, but for the Pyramids Temples Alive tour, we leave the color and cacophony and monuments and density of Cairo, and we fly to Aswan, to the peaceful natural surroundings where the Nile is wide. Now let's, let's take a look at the views of this beautiful Southern city. This is Aswan from the balcony of the Old Cataract Hotel. Sorry, Diane has just come in the room. Okay, let's start this again. Best places to be. It's dusk. The Nile is calm. It's August. 
just a few boats making their way. And across from our balcony, across the Nile, you can see Elephantini Island and the remains of Knum Temple, the god of the cataract and the inundation. It's like a mirror of the Nile right now. And there, the sun has sunk into the Western Mountains to be with Osiris at the end of the day as it cools off for a beautiful evening in Aswan. Wow, well, sunset on the Nile. So does fun. that set the mood? That's kind of the feeling you get and what's one of the things um, Anna and I worked very hard over the years to get the right pace of tour and leaving Cairo and going to, to Aswan is, um, is lovely, isn't it, Anna? Mm hmm Yeah. It's, uh, you'll, you'll find, uh, for the people that are doing, uh, both Cairo and Aswan, uh, it's quite different in Aswan. It's a slower pace. It's, uh, it's, it's Nubian as opposed to, Arab in a lot of the the day-to-day uh, -day stuff that you do there. So it's quite different. Diane got back online with us and uh, just wondering, uh, Diane, are you there now? Yes, I'm here. Hey, I just wondered, uh, what was your favorite Egypt memory? You traveled with us in 2018 and you're going back in two weeks. What yes, made you love it? And what did you, what got you hooked on Egypt about uh, about the tour? What was your favorite experience? Um, my favorite experience was the Red Pyramid mm -hmm. <laughs> and Aswan. Uh, Aswan, I think, was my favorite place. Um, but the Red Pyramid and crawling in, inside the pyramid was just uh, like a dream come true. Oh, that's I, so cool. I just couldn't. Yeah. It was, it was. I don't know. I'm speechless. It, it's been so long since I, I had dreamt about Egypt. And, and like I said, I, I grew up in a, in a small uh, farming community. Uh, I didn't even know about ancient history until I went to high school. And, uh, um, and uh, it was then like I learned about Greece and Crete and Athens and and then Egypt and like I said I was hooked. Uh, I'd always dreamed to visit Egypt and never ever thought it would happen. Uh, Laura and Anna, you made my dream come true. Um, and I never traveled by myself much, you know. And and it, but traveling with you guys is like traveling with old friends or traveling with your family. It's so comfortable and, and such a warm experience. Uh, well, that's experience of a lifetime for me. Um, I was like, I would travel to the ends of the world with you guys. Oh. Uh, it's just wonderful. Um, it, you know, traveling with you, like you're, you're traveling in the footsteps of pharaohs and the creators, the tombs and the pyramids. It, it's, and the, the modern experience with, with the, uh, with Egypt as well, the modern life from uh, the um, um, the the farmers taking their their um, their products to, to the markets on donkeys <laughs> and chickens in baskets on the back of motorcycles <laughs> and and the beautiful and elegant moss. That, Thank you so that much, Diane. And and then of course, then you've got the Nile. You know, it's just fabulous. Oh, yeah. I just got one more little thing that, that I, I, I'd like to say. Laura, you're so knowledgeable and you deliver that knowledge in a way that doesn't feel like being in a, in a classroom. Um, you make, you and Anna make this trip like a personal journey through history. And it's your journey, exactly, through ancient, ancient Egypt. And it did be was brought alive 
for me and it can be for everybody. Aww. Oh my God. Yeah. Gonna I, can't, cry. <laughs> I, I can't believe uh, Aunt Diane is saying this. We did not know she would say this. That's so kind of you, Diane. You're such a lovely traveler. This is the type quality of travelers we attract. Uh, beautiful, um, appreciative uh, travelers who are hungry for knowledge and experiences. And we do try to take really good care. We want to get back to taking you through Egypt, but just to let you know about us, we've been doing this for, for 10 years together. We're a good combination because I'm kind of, as you can tell, all over the map, very uh, quite lively and excitable. And Anna is grounded and is the, the mama bear, takes care of everyone, is very detail oriented. So together, we seem to uh, uh, we seem to be able to get it all right on these tours and we've created good itineraries. And I'm very excited to travel with Diane again. Um, and uh, we have just- to Go with you guys. Uh, yes, thank you. And just letting you know, oh, no more reduced deposit. Oh, actually we are doing reduced deposit on the later tours. So <laughs> just, I'm gonna just do this slide then I'm gonna get back to our experience in Aswan. Um, the tours we're, we're, uh, we are offering right now, we just sold out last week. Uh, we only take 20 people. We're actually over that for the November tour. There's been a lot of demand. So we're uh, sold out for November, 2023. We have space. We've got seven spaces. I don't know what, seven or eight on the February, 2023 tour. We would love to get to people on that. It's going to be very special. Uh, this upcoming tour in February beautiful weather, uh, fantastic time to go. Then if you're more of a long-term planner, there's lots of space still. You can travel with Jan and Marianne and Sandy on uh, February 26th. These are all repeat travelers. Uh, February 26th, 2024. So we'll tell you a little more later about our tours. And many of these are our pictures. That's how, how photogenic Egypt is. We're not the best photographers. You can't take a bad shot there. Um, so Abu Simbel, one of the unique things we have decided to do, it's worked out really well. And Diane, um, we're not, you're not going to Abu Simbel this time on the Tutankhamun tour, but what we have decided is it's great to get off in Aswan and go directly by road to Abu Simbel. You arrive later morning and there's nobody there. This is my husband and his three brothers looking like the four statues of Ramsey showing you the scale. We had these incredible temples to ourselves. We like to stagger our site visits uh, to maximize our privacy in the certain areas to avoid the crowds. It may not be as easy now that everyone's returning, but uh, look, look at this picture. This is incredible Abu Simbel temples of Ramses. Marianne took this shot, as you can see, she had no other tourists to contend with there. Uh, we just timed it perfectly. Um, and I won't spend too long on this. Abu Simbel is one of these kind of temples that everybody has to see in their life. It's the southernmost temple in Egypt. Uh, Ramses built here because he wanted to secure the border with Nubia. There are two temples and one, he was so kind. He had a, a, a chief wife, Nefertari, that died young. And he built her a beautiful temple as well, uh, dedicated to his wife and the goddess Hathor and his own temple. And the most amazing thing about them is they had to be moved with the building of the new Aswan Dam. They were taken together bit by bit and moved further back and further up in the mountain and recreated with every proportion exactly as it had been, uh, which is pretty astounding that they were able to uh, do that. Sorry, I have to let someone in and hide my meeting controls. So Abu Simbel was completely redone in the 1970s. It was a huge UNESCO project. And just to, just to imagine that they, they, they repositioned every block in a new area, it, it's, it's so incredibly exciting um, that this was done. And here's a view walking up to it. As you can see, if you, if you time yourself right, you don't have to contend with huge crowds if you go with a, a tour like ours. And again, there's that same picture. And what's amazing about Abu Simbel is when Ramses uh, created it, he made it so that on both the fall equinox and the spring equinox, the light of Ra at a certain time of day shines in and hits the gods in the sacred, uh, the sacred niche of the temple. 
and there it is, the sun coming in in the equinox. We can, we're not usually not there in the equinox, but it is just so many magical secrets in this incredible place. And there's the temple of Nefertari, uh, two temples to visit there. And there is uh, one of our travelers, uh, Spanish, lovely Spanish lady, who is admiring the beautiful colossal statue, not of Ramses, but of his queen Nefertari. And there's Ramses and Nefertari bringing, uh, bringing flowers to the gods. Now, we come from Abu Simbel, go back to Aswan, touring along the way after a great lunch, right, Anna? We usually um, have a beautiful Nubian lunch right there in the very southernmost border of Egypt. Yep. <laughs> You're on to... Oh, sorry. I just wondered if you wanted to comment on the, the journey back and, and uh, getting back to Aswan. Uh, it, it changes every time. Depends on what time we depart and what time we get back. Um, you'll get it. The beautiful sand dunes as you're driving along um, is a is wonderful. I, I love it. I, I love the views for the drive to and from. And yes, again, depending on the day and what have you, we'll either do the um, the the Nubian lunch, which is a, a beautiful little guest house there that has traditional Nubian food. Fantastic. I love that meal. It was just so special. Now, back in Aswan, Aswan is a place, not only the beauty of the, the Nile and the, of the water, there's many things to do there. It's a very relaxing and uh, fascinating center. One of the things we love to do is either a sunset or a sunrise camel ride up to this 8th century Christian monastery in the hills on Elephantine. And this is this is another one of these beautiful spiritual centers, not on the itinerary, one of a lot of your mainstream uh, trips, which was why it's so special. But this is what it's like to go in a very small group up at the beginning of the day or the end of the day, up the dunes to an ancient monastery. We are on camels going up to the monastery of San Simeon. <laughs> It's a beautiful morning trip way up into the hills in Aswan, Egypt. This is a section where we're all a bit bunched up, but there's some areas uh, sometimes we can go all the way along across the ridge and over the, to the tombs of Kebet al Hawa. Um, it's just so much more of a relaxed experience with these Bedouins taking their uh, really well fed, well treated camels up to the monasteries as opposed to the ones at Giza. And the monastery itself, I don't have as many pictures, but it is beautiful. Uh, the Temple of Philae, Anna, I think this is one of your favorites. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's the temple I love as much as the cats, but I love both. <laughs> uh, Philae is a, it's a magical one because you get in there to, to get to the temple, you have to go by boat. And my rule is if we can get on a boat on the Nile, we will. Um, if there's any, if we're crossing, if we can do it by boat instead of by bus, we will. Um, and getting to Philae, you have to go by boat. We go in these small boats. Um, and it, it's it's a it's quite a lovely experience um, just arriving by boat to get there, um, and it's a nice compact temple in that you can walk through and really get a feel of a full temple. And there's also a lovely little cafe there um, to sit and relax. So it, it's it's I think for me it's one of the most relaxing visits when you go into Philae. It's a, a very romantic temple. This is a temple of Isis, and it was the last surviving temple of Egypt. I don't think we have that video uh, with, uh, with our guide explaining about it, but uh, the rooftop is now open, which is new. Um, mm. And it's somewhere, it's the one place where we recommend if you want to go back in the evening to do the sound and light show, because it is truly magical. It's this, it's this, uh, basically this, audio visual show where you're walking through in the darkness and great British actors are 
are, uh, are dramatically recreating the land of Isis and Horus. But it can be a bit cheesy, the Pyramid Sound and Light Show or the Karnak one. Uh, this one is quite nice and very powerful. See it in the day, it's beautiful. You can, you can uh, also see the last hieroglyphic texts ever written. Uh, this is a Ptolemaic temple, the Greek style, still the Egyptian religion. It's, it's beautiful at day or the night. Um, Aswan is also uh, a place where they have one of the largest spice markets. The, the bazaar there is, is unique. You can go get any kind of spice you want, any kind of, this is a lady who is a crafts lady uh, who traveled with us. She specifically wanted to look at the fabrics and the different woven stuff, specialized spices. Um, you can get anything at the very beautiful Aswan market. It's great to go in the evening. Great Take cotton, beautiful cotton. Oh, cotton. Yes, cotton's a really good thing to buy in Egypt. The alabaster um, and what else, Anna, is good. I mean, the, the authentic crafts. Um, yeah, you, you can get, well, depending on timing, you can get clothes made in Luxor or Aswan, like with cotton. Um and just the, the textiles are all pretty good as well. Um, yeah. And of course, the jewelry, the gold and silver. This is my, oh, I'm not wearing it. It's, it's upstairs. My wedding ring is actually from Luxor. It's a really good place to buy gold and silver um, there as well. This is the Nubian. The Nubian food's different when you're in Aswan than the food you eat in Cairo, for example. There's a, I don't know, a lot of people prefer it. It's, it's very rich. It's very fragrant. The rich dark Nubian coffee is a specialty, the hot pots, uh, very, very delicious, different flavors as you travel through the country. Do you want to talk about the Nile cruise? Because part of our Pyramids Temples tour, uh, we're very selective in our cruise ship and our experience uh, going, up, uh, going down the Nile. Yeah, we do, um, I, I'm just draw, drew a blank, three nights. Yeah, three nights on the, if you go from Aswan to Luxor, it's three nights. If you do it the other way around, it's four nights. Um, this, we have a couple different ships we use, but this is the one we always use on the pyramids tour. Um, it's nice, small, great. It feels like you're, I don't know. It feels like you're part of the family. They're, the, the staff are great. There is a little pool there. It looks big in that picture. It's not very big. Um, but when you float along, especially at night, you can see, well, actually this is the afternoon. You can just sit there and watch the Nile go by. Um, rooms are actually not a bad size. Um, and yeah, so you can see on the map there, if you look down, oh, if you look down where it's at, where Philae Temple is there, we get on the boat there and we go all the way up to where it says Thebes. Um, so our our first stop um, is actually in Komombo. Um, and it's just this beautiful little compact temple, which Laura will tell you more about. But on both of these, uh, on this site, you dock right there. You dock, you walk off, and you go through, of course, market, uh, through some shops, and then into the uh, temple. So you don't have to go far, and you wake up to this view of that temple. It's pretty nice. Yeah, it's either at sunset or sunrise. I can't remember, depending on the direction you're going. But the, the light on the temple is beautiful. These, these are all along the Nile as you're cruising. These are Ptolemaic temples, which means they're very late period. They're basically when the Greeks ruled Egypt, these temples were built. But they're still in the Egyptian style. And they're so well preserved. The reliefs, the artwork is beautiful on them. And they're so gorgeously situated. So they really uh, make an enormous impact. <clears throat> Look at the quality of the carvings. Uh, this specifically is a temple to two gods. It's a double temple. Sobek, the crocodile god, who's associated with uh, the Nile flood, uh, the origins of the Nile. And this one called Horus the Elder, a uh, very, very ancient god. They both have sections of the temple devoted to them. And this is one of the Ptolemies, I believe it's four or five, who started this temple and uh, is celebrating these gods. Now, Sobek, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, beautifully, beautifully carved in this temple. And because this is partially the temple of the crocodile god, you have a crocodile museum on site. They actually did mummify crocodiles, not just pharaohs in ancient Egypt. 
And that's a fascinating little museum. You can see the animal gods uh, got great attention in the later period and were afforded all of the honor and luxuries that the great kings were. They've also done a lot of work in that temple too. So every time we go there, they've moved things around and you can see a bit more um, like the Nilometer that they cleaned up and the museum, they've done some great work around the museum as well. Mm -hmm. Amazing things you can see on some of these temples, like the, the first documentation of surgical instruments. I don't know if there's any doctors out there, but there you go. Interestingly, this temple was built in Ptolemaic times when the great city of Alexandria was flourishing, uh, attracting the, the, the biggest thinkers and the greatest scientists from around the world to do research and studies and symposiums. So it makes sense that the temple in the south would celebrate surgical techniques. Uh, there's also an early calendar there. It's just so many wonders at this site. And this is, I love this picture because it shows how close the cruise ships uh, get to the actual temple and the effect. Uh, this is from my trip in 2010. It's an ancient picture, but there you go. Um, it's temple, it, the Nile cruise, you have a beautiful day at rest where you can just read and watch the world go by, but you're also stopping at three different temples along uh, as you travel. And one of them is Edfu Temple. And this is a gorgeous temple. Um, and it's to the god Horus. It's the best preserved temple in Egypt. It's a beautiful first pylon, the entry point uh, to the temple. And this is what it's like. Look at the color of the reliefs. It's so well preserved. This is our picture uh, with our guide showing, uh, showing what's going on. Gorgeous Edfu Temple. And you get there by this means, you actually have to take a little kalesh to get to the temple, a horse and buggy. All sorts of, you know, people say, oh my God, we've traveled by a donkey, we've, or we've traveled by camel, we've traveled by boat, we've traveled by bus, we've traveled by plane, kalesh. We, we travel many different ways on our trips to Egypt. I just wanted to correct you there. Sorry, it's two temples that we see on the, on the cruise. You see Komombo and, and Edfu. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Komombo, but when we're on the cruise, we're also sometimes touring the temple, temples that are in Aswan and Luxor. Yes. Is probably yeah. where I got I got yeah. confused. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so somebody just asked, Dendera is after, uh, it's from Luxor. We see Dendera from Luxor. When you go on the Nile cruise, it's not one of the temple stops. You, you'd have to, you have our tour, always makes a point of seeing it because it's our favorite temple in Egypt. We're going to get there in a minute, uh, but that's a good question. So Luxor, of course, the ancient name was, was Waset. The, to the Greeks, it was Thebes. And it's a very dramatic terrain because you have this narrow band of fertile plain where you can see the farmers still growing bananas and corn and, of course, wheat. And then you have the desert and you have the West Bank and the land of the, the, the setting sun, and that is on the west side of the Nile is where all of the mortuary complexes are, the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of the Queens, the mortuary temples, uh, and it's where you take the balloon trip that we're gonna show you. And on the east bank is where you have the temples to the gods, you have Karnak and Luxor Temple. So you can see it from this picture too, it's a little grainy, but you have this very, usually the hotels, there are a few hotels on the west bank, we like to stay on the east, and you have the great temples here on the land of the living and then the cross. It's like this, um, this very meaningful crossing when you cross the Nile in a boat and you go into the land of the dead. Um, uh, beautiful. And on the West Bank is where you see a lot of the great monuments. This is how it's laid out. There you might recognize some of these sites. The last great temple of Pharaonic Egypt. Uh, Medmet Habu, one of the best preserved here. Uh, the Valley of the Queens, where we have um, Hatshepsut's uh, great Daryl Bari Temple, awesome. the, new, the new Golden City of Amenhotep III, uh, Daryl Medina, the Village of the Workers. Oh, there's the Temple of Hatshepsut over there, sorry. And uh, the Valley of the Queens is there. And the Valley of the Kings is around the back there. Did you have something, Anna, or a question? No, I was just coughing, sorry. Oh. Okay. <laughs> And of course, uh, the most famous site of the West Bank of, of the Nile at Aswan, 
is the Valley of the Kings and uh, very, very special, very beautifully developed for tourism. You take a little electric tram in, which is actually, they're going to have electric trams also in the pyramids soon, not just yet, but soon. And uh, you go in, you can, do you want to talk about the logistics of touring the Valley of the Kings, Anna? Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. It's fun. You go on the little <laughs> down, down into the starting point of the visit of the Valley of the Kings. And so the Valley of the Kings, when you have your entrance, includes three, three tombs. Um, and those change all the time, which ones are open and which ones are not. And that's mainly to preserve the tomb. So we're, you don't have, you know, 5,000 people going to one tomb all the time. Then we have special uh, passes for this one here. This picture here is, is Ramsey's 5-6. Um, and so that's a special ticket. And then, then they have the other special entrances, which is Tut and then um, uh, Sati. So what we do is when we get up there, we'll say, okay, does anybody else want to go into five or six? And we'll get the, the entrance tickets before that. And then the guides will say, okay, so these are the ones that are open. And here's how I feel would be most logical to go through the, the tombs. Uh, the guides cannot go into the tombs with you, thankfully. Um, I say thankfully, because if you have 10 guides explaining uh, things inside of a tomb, it's pretty loud and, and it's really hard to hear. And it's very dangerous for the tombs that much talking and breath on 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 the sites is is not good for the tombs so um yeah so we go around and and we'll have a uh, a place where we sit they have some great little areas where you can sit that are covered and say okay um laura might say okay i'm going to take everybody into ramsey's four and then and then you might carry on to other ones and then there might be some people who are like yeah i really want to go into horam Heb. I want to go on the very back. I want to go on the hard, hard tombs. Um, so we have tons of time to explore around there. The big thing with the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens um, is it can be really hot. So we always bring in water to make sure everybody's, uh, and at some point I might say, you're not leaving until everybody has water. <laughs> so if it's hot, we make sure you're, you're covered with water as well. One of the, the advantages, I hope uh, you will see it as an advantage of our tour is when you book typical tours, you'll always have an Egyptian guide and they're varying in quality. We of course have the best. We have fabulous Hussam and Rami and very careful to pick them, but they can't go with you in these tombs. But you have a Canadian Egyptologist, usually two with Francois coming in the tombs with you. These tombs are really difficult to understand. What on earth is going on here? There are these priestly fantasies. What are they out of their mind? It's not easy like the daily life scenes in the old kingdom tombs. It's good to have an Egyptologist to say, what is that weird headless creature uh, with knives around it and the snake coming out of his head? It's good to have an Egyptologist with you. Egyptian guides can't be there, but we can. Also, if you have- I, I just, I just want to interrupt. You cannot guide in the tombs. But we can whisper so, things to you. Exactly. You but questions. what is great is you can say, what is that weird thing? What is that weird thing? So Laura can point things out. Um, and I just say that because some people are like, why is she not giving a full guided tour? Because you can't. Um, and it, and if she does, it, it's the, the guards can get pretty upset. But this. it's great Look to be able to point thing. things out. Are you going to be able to figure this out? It's I can't even figure it out usually. No, I'm getting better at it. It's all the books of the dead. They're all, there is a logic to this insanity. So um, anyway, we'll talk about it later. Here is something gorgeous. The, the, the workers that built the Valley of the Kings saved all the best ideas and the best paint and the best efforts for their own little tombs, their little gems. This is what it looks like to go inside their tombs. This is the tomb of Inner Cow. Look at the paint. We go to Dear Old Medina. It's amazing. And these, the experience here will stay with you the rest of your life. Look at this. This is my own little video inside this tomb. Uh, blind harpist playing to Inner Cow and his wife in the afterlife. There's a crazy uh, aspect of the sun god Ra as a cat killing Apophis the snake. Um, 
uh, they didn't quite understand the books of the dead themselves, but they got some of the motifs and they put it in their own tomb. Um, they're just amazing to visit. There's a few of them open. We go to the village of the workers and we go inside some of these two. And arguably they're even nicer than the king's tombs, I think. The colors are amazing. And with these one, which is really nice too, is we just split up because you really can only fit five or six people in each tomb. Um, and it, it, it's a great visit. Yeah. So um, Anna detests mainstream shopping. I, I actually quite like shopping myself, lady. So if you want to go shopping to the markets with me, I would do that. But Anna, you do love the authentic stuff, don't you? Yeah, these guys are wonderful. Um, I mean, I, I figure if we can support the craftsmen that are there that are making authentic um, and sometimes copies, sometimes traditional, but supporting the craftsmen is so important. And these, these guys here are wonderful. I have a very fussy uh, friend who came with us in 2020 and who always has to have the best of everything. And she went crazy at this Ahmed, uh, Rasul, who's the fine craftsman sitting outside one of the noble's tombs and picked one of his beautiful works. He's tr a truly fine artisan. You can also get these beautiful translucent alabaster vases. They're very nice. Along, as we mentioned, uh, the beautiful fine cotton, linens, and the gold and silver jewelry. The highlight, Anna, I think for so many people are taking the is taking the balloon trip in, in Luxor. Yeah, and the, the best part of the balloon trip um, is it's different every single time. I've probably done it, I don't know, six to 10 times. And every time we go we are to see different things. So this will give you a good idea. We are sailing 100 feet above Western Thebes in this incredible balloon ride. Uh, right now sailing over top of Medinet Habu, the last great temple of Egypt of Ramses III. And in front of me, you see the beautiful, fertile banks of, the, of, of Luxor, yeah, yeah, yeah. where all the agriculture is grown. But this is, we're very, very high on this balloon. Huge. We just sailed over Dar al Bari. And wonderful views from high above the West Bank. The sun is just rising. Don't let the 4 a.m. wake up call scare you. It's worth it. You come back for breakfast. You have a little tea, you go and it's glorious. Mm. Um, and like, for example, you just, when Laura started that video, you can see uh, Men at Habu. Um, last time I did it, we ended just past Men at Habu and we were like, you could read the hieroglyphs. We were went right over top. So every time it's different. There it is, okay. Um, Always early. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, this picture is a bit grainy. I've got better. Karnak Temple is the largest religious site uh, in the world. Um, I think uh, Khmer Rouge, is that right? In Cambodia, is this kind of right in? Hmm? Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat, sorry. Uh, Angkor Wat, sorry. Not good with my Cambodian history. Um, but this is our group from 2020, I believe it is. Um, and uh, you can see the Hypostyle Hall in Karnak. It's massive to cover. So we have our own tactics to get around to some of the highlights and the best kept secrets. But this Hypostyle Hall is un unbelievable. It was built by Seti I and his son Ramses the Great in 1279 BC. Um, this, these halls replicate a field of papyrus, uh, symbolic of regeneration. It was, it was a sanctified space that only the priests could enter. But Everybody loves to go there now. The tourism, the, the tourists love it. And um, now I've got a little video because we were there in the blazing heat. I don't recommend going in August like us insane people do. Francois and I did. But we were there at noon, 50 degrees plus, And this is what we saw in 2021 summer. If you are planning a trip, the beautiful Karnak Temple and the Hypostyle Hall of Seti and Ramses II, in, in 2021 or 22, you're in for a surprise because in a few months they will have finished restorations in this section of the Hypostyle Hall where they're restoring the colors. 
look. Look at what they're doing. Beautiful colors are being restored right now as we visit in August 2021. Teams are working even in the heat of August. Right now, it is probably close to 100 degrees. It's about 95 degrees outside. It's about 11.30 on Sunday on Saturday afternoon. Restoration. Beautiful colors in the high stop. If you are planning a trip, there it is. The beautiful Karnak Temple. And that's what it looks like today, evidently. I've not seen the finished product. The last time I was there was, was that trip. That was a bit hot. I uh, couldn't believe they were working in that weather, but Egyptians are used to it. Um, Anna, how, tell us about how we make Karnak more understandable, more easy, more special. Well, as, as Laura said, it, it's massive. It, um, what we usually do is we'll have the guide take us through like an hour tour going through um, and, and then point out different areas for people to see depending on what, what focus they have. Um, but one of the big things is we go through the open air museum and it's a, it's a great little spot. And usually there's not any other groups there. Um, and, and it's a wonderful little visit through there. And you can see there's one lone tree there where we can sit in the shade. <laughs> um, yeah, so we we try to give you an overview uh, of depending on on the on Laura and 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 um, Hosam what they want to take you through, and then we'll give you a little area. To, okay, we're going to meet up here, um, and there's thankfully the cafe in Karnak is now open again. It was closed for a long time, and then we'll meet up at the cafe. So you have like couple hours, depending on the day, a couple hours on your own to wander around. And uh, we'll always be wandering around, uh, scooping up people if they get lost along the way. Yeah, and we definitely can steer you to the best, like going to this Sekhmet uh, shrine. What a spooky, interesting little area. The area of Tan Sekhmet there is very special. The oldest <clears throat> area of Karna within that open air museum is this Middle Kingdom chapel that has been restored and recreated uh it's it's very special too so lots of different areas so we're getting towards the end actually we're getting close to 4 30 we might go a little bit over um but uh wanted to talk about dendera temple uh it's our favorite temple this is our group in 2020 and doesn't look much from here maybe it looks like okay that looks like a nice temple with the half or columns Get inside and take a look at this temple, another Ptolemaic temple. It actually was started by Cleopatra's father. Um, this is probably where Cleopatra honeymooned with Julius Caesar as she went, uh, she went up the, down the Nile or up the Nile. And it was finished, this incredible hypostyle hall was finished by under Tiberius, the, the Roman Empire, emperor, I should say. The ceilings restored by the, the Italian team are amazing. And it's got three floors. You can go down to the crypt. You can go up to the uh, to the rooftop where the New Year's festival was celebrated. And now um, our guide Hussam tells us there's a second crypt that has been opened. So it is amazing. I don't have enough pictures of Dendera. I have to keep going because we're running out of time. Um, the food, what can we say? The food is amazing in Egypt. It doesn't have the fancy French... Uh, sauces of going to Paris or the, or the, uh, uh, I don't know, the amazing cuisine, the, the, the type of cuisine you'd get in Italy, but it's got fresh, beautiful cuisine, Middle Eastern cuisine, the baladi bread, uh, the fresh roasted chicken, everything is grown there year round. So it's so much better, I think better for you, fresher than the cuisine we get in North America. Uh, the juices, the fresh juice bar, the Ramsey's Hilton, oh my God, I could, I have dreams about it, although I'm not supposed to have fresh juice, but it is delicious. The dips, my favorite dip is tomea. Uh, the, as I say, you can eat like a king as a vegetarian there. Koshari, the special pasta and rice dish. Anna, what's your favorite food? Oh my goodness. I love the, uh, I can never remember the name of it, the, that green gloopy stuff. 
Okay, you can have the green gloopy stuff. I don't love that stuff so much. I think it's called molik moliki. Okay, okay. You can have all of my your the molokai soups. Yeah. It's an acquired taste. It's, uh, it's uh anyways. I, I love all the food, but uh, I I love that. It's watercress. It's it's pretty amazing. I, I'm not going to and, be happy with stuff taken. Fool for breakfast. I every I can't wait to get there and have my fool and the they call it white cheese. Never got any other name other than white cheese. Um, so I have the fool, which is is uh, fava beans, and then the white cheese for breakfast. And they have all these little dips like uh, cumin and little spices that you add as you like. And that's the one thing I love about the Egyptian cuisine is quite often you add what you want. So they don't give you this this dish that's with a ton of flavor. You add what you like as you go. It's it's so varied, it's so wonderful, and it is so fresh and delicious. Mm -hmm. um, quickly, uh, the Egyptian uh, Museum, it's not the gem, but this is another museum that's just opened. I was just there two weeks ago. Uh, I'm going to skip my intro, it's just me talking outside the museum. I wanted to show you the video I have here. A lot of these are symbols, right, in ancient Egypt. This is the jet column, right? This represents the back column. This is Osiris. My husband's This speaking. column over here. Beside it are, the, this would have been the double uraeus, right? Uh, this would have been worn on the crown of the pharaohs, as an example, right? Over over there, you've got the unk symbol, right? The oh, symbol of life. The mummies. There we go. So, um, anyway, and also this, these are showing different mummy cases or coffins. So I just wanted to say the, the, uh, the new National Museum of Egyptian Civilization in Fustat, it's the area near where the Coptic Cairo is, the hanging church and the old synagogue, beautiful new structure. It's the new home to the royal mummies, but it's more than that. Um, certainly the, the royal mummies, you cannot take pictures, but they're now housed in family groups with their coffins, with beautiful explanations. You can see all of them, understand their stories. Really beautiful. I was quite impressed. Um, really enjoyed that. And there's about this wonderful display. So the, the, the key two exhibition halls are on the main floor. Then you go down into the Osirian basement and you see, uh, you see the mummies. There's also beautiful displays of arts and crafts of Egypt through the ages. This is another video, but I'm going to skip it for now. I'll be putting it on our YouTube channel. Um, and, uh, and I think I've got a beautiful Middle Kingdom tomb models at the NMEC for a very short period of time between 2000 and 800, 1800 BCE. The uh, nobles and the royals would put these in their tombs. And I just did want to show you this video, I believe. This shows you the whole panorama of the main exhibit hall. We are in the main floor of the National Museum of Civilization. And I love how this is organized. It's organized chronologically. You can see some of the early flint blades initially. There's uh, the Pyramid Age, and it carries on. What are you seeing over there in the corner? Greco-Roman, you see two columns. Ah, Greco-Roman. The Coptic period. The Coptic and the period. period. And then you go around the room in this main exhibition hall, and you get to the Islamic period. And there we have the famous tents. Okay, so it gives you a view of the room. And again, I'm gonna keep um, uh, flicking through this. The Cairo Museum in Tahrir is looking beautiful. If any of you have visited it before, it was a bit of an antiquities warehouse. Nothing had changed in 50 years and everything was just lumped together. Um, and very, very dirty and run down. Right. They, oh. It is gorgeous. Now here's Djoser, the builder of the Step Pyramid, with the beautiful faience tiles from his underground chambers. Here is uh, King Capre, this magnificent masterpiece. And behind is his son's statuary, King oh, Mekhaure's masterpiece. Just so cool. beautiful. The paint, uh, I had an interview with the um, curator of this museum, which I'm gonna be publishing soon, uh, Dr. Sabah uh, Raz, 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 Abdul Razek, thank you lovely, quiet, beautiful lady um, talking about her vision. Uh, they restored it to Maspero's days. The paint color, everything is amazing. Maydoum geese, now you have a sense of how it looked when it was oh, from the tombs in Maydoum. 
It's the main floor has been redone. And yes, Tut's treasures are still there until the museum opens. The gem, the mask will, run, will be the last thing that moves. Everybody needs to see some of Tut's treasures. It's not lost in transition. There are still treasures to see at this fabulous museum. Everybody's asking about, about the Egyptian, the Grand Egyptian Museum. The answer is we don't know. Um, Dr. Salima Ikram just put on Facebook, oh, they might open uh, one hall on November 1st. She just put that on on Facebook. I heard it's not gonna be till next year. We don't know is the answer, but it will be this magnificent, the world's largest archeological museum in the world and uh, a thing of wonder um, at the on the plateau, at the Giza plateau. And I don't want to say any more about it until we really know when it's opening, but we're hoping our 23, 24 tours will get to see this, even our 2022 tours, if, if Salima Ikram is correct. Um, we invite you all to come to Egypt with us and to ask us any questions. We have small group tours. Uh, we, as Diane so kindly said, we try to teach treat you like family, uh, really cater to your needs, want to make sure your rooms are, are perfect, your experiences are memorable, and that everyone enjoys every moment of the trip. We try to have lots of inclusions. Uh, we, we provide a lot of value in our tours. And Anna, do you want to continue to talk about our tours? <laughs> I think you covered it all. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, yeah, I think you've pretty well covered most there. Um, I think, why don't we just uh, have a quick question and answer uh, if you want to just run over the tour. So, yeah. So, just... we have, we, uh, we, for those who joined us late, again, unfortunately, right now you can get on a waiting list, but the November 2023 tour is sold out. But the February one, we have about six or seven spaces. So, we welcome you to inquire about that. And the 2024 one, there is quite a bit of room. Um, this is our iconic tour that we have the itinerary perfected. We know exactly how to time this. All of the great sites, uh, you get Abu Simbel, you get the Nile cruise, you get uh, Giza, Saqqara, everything that we've mentioned in this presentation. Um, we get rave reviews. Um, you can, this is just the reviews from our 2020 tour. And these are experienced travelers. I can't believe Don and Carol said it was their best vacation ever. And Jen Wilhelms uh, rebooked again. This is the kind of thing people are saying about us. Um, and uh, we hope we will impress you just as much. If anyone is super spontaneous and would like to join us in two weeks, we might, Anna would have to check, we might be able to squeeze another, another individual or couple or so onto our incredible Tutankhamun tour, uh, where we're actually going to Amarna in Middle Egypt. We're not doing the Nile cruise, but we're going behind the scenes at Colossi Memnon, staying at the Winter Palace. It's a 100th anniversary celebration tour. So I shouldn't say too much about it. It's probably not in the works for most of you. Those of you, some of you are on that are going on this and I can't believe how exciting. There's gonna be so many special experiences. And that's one of the things we do in all our tours is try to give special experiences. The one we're doing in two weeks, we're good friends with Barry Kemp, uh, who is a legend. I, one of, I guess he's probably the person I know that I'm most proud to know. I have to say a, a legendary archeologist. He's amazing, he's a humble man. He's been working at Amarna for 40 years. He'll give us a behind the scenes tour. And um, we're going to the Colossal Memnon. And you know what, I may inquire to see if, you know, if we can get a glimpse again for our future tours too. But we'd love any of your questions, if you'd like to get on board with us, if you like what you've seen. And uh, I think, uh, and why to travel now? There's just so many new things to see. If you watch the new documentaries, uh, there is, gosh, so many new sites, new museums. Uh, Avenue of the Sphinxes is now open. Uh, it, it's a very exciting time. And why travel with us? If you look at the value dollar for dollar, you see, you'll see tours that are about two to $3,000. You get what you paid for. You do not include what our tour, you need to have more. You'll end up paying more than what we're pricing our tours at. And we include everything. Anna, do you want to speak to what makes us different? Actually, I would, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to answer questions because I know a lot of people are getting ready to leave. So okay. I, if you want to just exit. Exit, yeah. 
Um, we had some people asking about the COVID situation in Egypt right now. It's pretty well the same as most places. It's 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 around. Um, the guides, everybody in tourism has had their vaccinations and shots. They're still very high. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, protocols for cleaning all the sites and the hotels. We are pretty well back up to 100% for hotels and the sites being opened. Um, but for safety protocols, they're still very being very proactive on cleaning the sites and the vehicles are cleaned all the time. Well, we have hand sanitizers on the bus. I always suggest to travel with hand sanitizers even before COVID hit. <laughs> it's just so much easier to keep your hands clean with um, hand sanitizers other than water and soap, which sometimes works in little places, sometimes doesn't. Um, somebody was asking about visas required. There is the Egyptian visa. You can get it on arrival. That's what Laura and I always do. And most of the people traveling there, you just get it. Our guides meet you when you get off the plane. They'll say, do you have your visa? And you'll say no or yes. Um, there's a little tiny booth. It's basically a bank. <laughs> and you give them 25 US and they give you a stamp and you put it in your passport. It's, it's, it, and it's like a postage stamp. It's not like a stamp because they'll give you a stamp, goes in your passport, then the, the transfer person will take you through immigration. And then when you get to immigration, they'll give you the stamp, you know, like when you arrive in any other country, then they'll stamp that stamp <laughs> to say you've got your visa. You can do it ahead of time online. Their online visa site is pretty glitchy. Um, it does work, but it, it can be a bit of a pain. So if you did want to do that and have trouble, you can just give me a call. Uh, it's the exact same price. It's 25 US. But I will stress again, there's only one official site. There are so many fake visa sites out there that you'll end up paying three times as much money and not have a visa. Yeah. So that's why we suggest to get the visa on arrival. And I don't mean to interrupt you, Anna. I'm worried that the call will end at 4.45, as Virginia said. Is there anyone who has any other questions? Oh, I see. I'm going through the questions, Laura. That, that oh, no, no, no. But anyone want to pipe up with questions as well? I just wanted to know or if anyone's interested. In... You want me to finish the questions that are here or no? Sure. Okay. Uh, Egyptian pounds. Uh, I suggest don't get pounds until you arrive there. Um, Exchange rates in North America are horrific, and you can get uh, the pounds at the bank, at the hotel, or at the front desk of the hotel, depending on which hotel. The other thing is the bank machines are very are are pretty well most places in in Luxor or Cairo, and you can just withdraw pounds right from your bank account. Um, just make sure you take a decent amount because your bank may charge you five bucks to withdraw it. Um, and then that way you're getting the exact exchange rate from your bank to the pounds instead of going to US. Having said that, I always suggest travel with US dollars because sometimes the bank machines don't work and it's much easier to convert US dollars than Canadian dollars. Um, sorry, I'm going through. As Sandra uh, was asking about the admission to the tombs or if you have to book it in advance. And Sandra, you don't have to pre-book. No, so how it works for the tombs um, is, is we get the tickets as we're entering, um, for example, the Valley of the Kings, I think is the one you were looking at. And we'll ask ahead of time, does anybody want a special entrance into SETI, which is about usually around 60 to 100 US dollars. And then we'll get that ahead of time because it's, it's easier than once we get into the Valley, you have to come back out to buy the, the, the passes. So we'll ask the question when we're on the bus, okay, does anybody want to go to Ramses five or SETI and sort it out before we get in? Um, yeah. I didn't want to say Kyla's got her lovely, it looks like a greyhound. Oh, Very nice. <laughs> Hello, gorgeous. I, I think if I've missed your question, let, let me know. But, but like Laura said, just unmute yourself and ask a question um, if you want, please yeah, go ahead. And if any, oh. Go ahead, Mark. I have a question for for those of us who are going on the uh, tours of Tune Conum tour. Yep. Could you email us the list of which are the optional tours uh, sure. that are not included, and then what the, the prices might be, just so we can make sure we've got enough U.S. cash to cover all that plus our, our other spending. 
Yeah, there's really no optional tours except for the one that we'll be doing at the very beginning. Uh, um, and we're just working on that. And like I said, it'll be around 40 to 60 US. Okay. But we okay. don't really have, besides yeah. the balloon, we don't have balloon. that many optional. Like, it's not like every day there's an optional tour. Actually, so yeah. Most the days are, are too busy for anything optional. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're for uh, optional tombs. Will there be optional tombs for us or... Yes, and that would be, well, you're pretty well covered for most of that. I'll take a look and I'll send an email, but I, the okay. only optional would, yeah, the only optionals I can think of would be if you want to see SETI or something like that. And I'll double check on the price because I know the prices have changed. Okay. And yeah, sure, I'll send that out this week. We're including Tutankhamen for the Tutankhamen tour. It kind of makes sense. So uh, we, we don't have a lot of, yeah. you know, we we're pretty inclusive in our tours. It's just a couple of extras that we don't. So, um, yeah. So, um, yes, this is, uh, it, does anyone else have any other questions or are interested in getting the itinerary or, uh, if anyone wants to speak out or, or future travelers. We filled your brains. <laughs> We want to thank you very, very much for coming to our uh, travel tips talk. Uh, we hope we've given you a food for thought. And for those who are traveling with you soon, lots of excitement. Email me if you want resources, if you want to know what should I read, how should I prepare, or what is this? Uh, I, I got lots of bibliographies and, and information. I am very passionate about ancient Egypt. And Anna is a logistics queen. Uh, she knows about the air routes. She knows about the any operational concerns, visas, anything you want to know about. How how do I get there from here? Uh, that's Anna's specialty. Laura, an all important question: Do you have to pay for the washrooms? No, <laughs> that's a good question. No, not, not in Egypt. Well, uh, no, sorry, I I backpedal. Um, there is a couple of sites that you do have to pay. Um, it's usually like equivalent to about a five cents or ten cents. But quite often, like for example, one that comes to mind is Philae. Um, they'll what we'll do is we'll give the washroom people here, here's like 50 pounds and and everybody can just go in to save the hassle. Um, but yeah, if you do come across the more and more they're updating the site, so it's you don't have to pay. But if you do, it it really is like five or ten pounds, which is like, well, not even that, it's like one pound which is like, I think maybe 10 cents somewhere around there. Great, thank you. Yeah. I wanted to ask about uh, if we want to get a uh, SIM card. Yes. For, you know, while we're in Egypt and then we're also heading to Jordan afterwards, a card that would work in both countries. What's the best way to do that? Have you got experience with that? I have to check with the guys there because I know last time I tried to get a SIM card, they said you had to wait. And then, then they said you didn't have to wait. So it's a bit of a... I'm not 100% sure, so I'll ask the guys there because you can get it at the airport, but I know they were having a bit of an issue where it wasn't as simple as it used to be, so I'll, I'll ask them on that. Uh, um, Anna, yeah. it's Harold. Um, I am going to look at an, uh, get an eSIM, which uh, you can get ahead of time. Uh, yeah, let me... I'm sorry. Aralo, A-I-R-A-L-O. -A yeah one and then another one's called global eSIM. Right, I've heard of that one. You just need to have a more modern phone. Um, yeah. Okay. So I have something that I used in a couple of countries like in, in Europe and um, Brazil that worked pretty well. I don't know how. Um, it's called Glocal Me. It's actually a portable Wi-Fi. Oh, so that oh, way. That. Yeah, so you, you know, you pay a hundred and some dollars and then you pay um, 30 days for Egypt. And then you can use up to, you know, five or 10, 16 gigabytes or, so that worked pretty well. And, you know, we drove everywhere in, in the UK and, and we were able to get um, maps and updates and call everybody. And Luis, so- what was the name of that again? Could you just- Yes, yeah, Glocal. G L O Glo C A L me. Okay, thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Global call. Global call. Ah, excellent. Global, yeah. And uh, Virginia just wrote one in two, Hola Fly. So there's a whole bunch of, there's some options in the chat box for you guys. Isn't it pathetic? We're going to a country with amazing monuments in history and we got to be connected on our phones. We cannot be looking at our phones the whole trip, <laughs> but it's good to have them with us and some people need them for business. Yeah. Well, my concern is if we land in Egypt and there's nobody to greet us, how can we call the person that we're supposed uh, to call, right? Well, never uh, happened. The one, never the, happened, Vivian. The one thing too with... Um, my suggestion, not just for Egypt, but anywhere, because I have this happen, you know, people don't meet up or whatever, is always go to the at the transfer desk and say, hey, this is the person that's supposed to pick me up and they're not here and they'll call for you. Oh, okay. You know, like they're so yeah. good, especially there. Just say, hey, um, I'm waiting for this guy and I can't find him, but here's my local contact. Can you please call them? And they'll be like, oh my God, and they'll get it sorted out in two seconds, especially in Cairo. <laughs> Okay. Um, but as Laura said, actually, not even just on our tours, I've, I've, I think only once had somebody, uh, they had to go hunt her down because she turned the wrong way. And she actually went to the wrong part of the airport. And she was escorted by uh, security. <laughs> she went the wrong way, went through a door that somebody happened to leave open. I don't know how she did it. Um, but yeah, 10, 15 minutes later, my guide's like, Oh, my goodness, I was looking everywhere for you. <laughs> So yeah, because uh, what we have is is the the transfer person's actually in the secure area. So when you get off the plane, they're they're right there. Yeah, yeah, you're you're but, taken yeah. care of the moment you get off the plane. You're you're going to be met and taken. So uh, that's you know uh, one of the funniest things I had. And Terry, lovely Terry, isn't on the call, but he he contacted me last year. I think he's going in February said, Laura, my wife and I want to come early and uh, poodle around Cairo and rent a car. What do you think? And I, I just couldn't, I didn't want to laugh in his face, but it was, I just thought it was the most hysterical idea. Things not to do in Cairo, to oh, rent a car and go uh, freewheeling. It's like, no, yeah. you need to be, I mean, you could, if you're adventurous, which I would do is have a driver, right? Yeah. If you want to go around on your own and we can set you up with a driver. You don't want to try the roads in Cairo on your own or anywhere in Egypt. No. <laughs> it's an adventure enough to cross the road. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's an adventure I love, but it is an adventure. <laughs> Absolutely. I see so many of the people who are coming in in, uh, in a couple of weeks are with us. And it's so great to see your face, Kyla. And Harold, Harold and Chuck and Luis have not met you before. Vivian uh, and Mark and of course Diane, you'll all be traveling together and hope other people will join Zoe next year and uh, Camilo and uh, and uh, Darlene and my dear my dear friend uh, Doug. Uh, I hope uh, other people will uh, uh, will consider joining us too. I think we've been long enough. Poppy, good to see you're online. Any questions? Email us. We'll be following up with an email and we really hope to take you to Egypt one day soon or in the next couple of years. And look forward to seeing all you guys in a couple of weeks that are yeah. on the tech tour. Yeah. Can't wait Thanks to be you, everybody. Bye. 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 Have a great night.